It's Shango who performs in RCA the Paris style, his arms reaching, pointing, remember. It's Dambala too, dialing, fixing me, 604 specific, Matsushita across the Pacific, and that's where we're taking it. You can blame all ignorance on the failure to feed the ghosts in these techniques. There is immortality in the track, a snake chasing its tail, the groove moving the text, the descendants speak unsheathing the record, the beat of skin remembered, the dawning of masks, we become member. Legba's rude cock rockism forever coming, we are conscious now, aroused, the noise gates blown down, now we have beautiful monuments to our pronouns carved from rock. We are awake. We have archived ourselves. The ancestors we have honored will be born as our descendants to remember us. We are conscious as we speak our names. So we live. We don't sleep. We drop silence. The cock has crowed. The chickens are home to roost under eaves. We are awake as surely as we speak our names. are feeding back. Hendrix played that, the back talk, the lip. His hymn was tradition and ignition, following the pillar of an inner emolition. Back homists want to bring it on, want the black star line, every ear here, a siding god, and a line in, line out, I. I am plugged into my mixer, lashed with wax stopping my ears, tacking into tradition, taking it all in. The phones, the speakers, the way it was, is, and ever shall be, the intractable track of the word. Lyrical, prosaic, settler, native, American, North American, nationalism, segregation, gold, pyrite, familiarity, contempt, ocean, border, sub, urban, dispersal, Determinacy, mulatto, mestizo, metis, cabra, Eurasian, creole, colored, colored, split. Those who have no history are doomed. I am plugged into the tradition to stop my ears against the temptation. I can't get next to you. The drum is the black hole. Shango is the breath into coal, into diamond. Without the drum's death, we have to watch ourselves, stop our ears against the soundlessness, the sacredness in the wax, the gree gree, the juju, the repeat. The sacredness is the popular, the ventriloquist act, the limbo, zombification, dancing in the low-ceilinged cargo hold. The author was born in 1972, in 1972, the Matsushita Electric Industrial Company introduced the Technique's SL-1200 turntable. They do not pay respects to Shango or Raiju, and that is the source of the wow and flutter of our souls. The word is the body of Osiris, 
spliced. A communion is happening worldwide, a whirlwind of performances, black English, black expropriation scattered to the four corners. Every ear shall hear. The words of the prophets are written in graph. <coughs> James Brown never said, say it loud, I'm mixed race in a satellite of the US and proud. <laughs> Only had he. There's no echo, but there is culture falling from the firmament like Virgo, and I am an instrument of the verge, cupping the snail shell to my ear, hearing and placing the phrases brought forth from rock by Thoth, the living palindrome and magician. Transcription is the fixing of fiction as history, and speaking is the encryption of the world as euphony. Every ear shall hear, every eye shall see, we ain't maintaining, yet we be defamiliar. My family history is fractured, impure, history imported with deft, warp, and weft. You don't know your past, you don't know your future. History imperative, you don't maintain, yet it gets told. doth the city sit solitary that was full of people. Turn thou us unto thee, O Lord, and we shall be turned. Renew our days as of old. Act like you know. I take my cue out of crates and boxes. Speak by outfoxing rock. That's hip-hop in the boondocks. The relief package drop zone. I echo New York back like a code cracker, reality hacker, a crusoe. Cut cued. I intervene by plugging in code, tapping Babylonian roots, my cuneiform. Starting all over again is gonna be rough when there's no glossary for the wicked, no rest for the ibid, no justice, no peace, no misprision, no progress. Just the ether of other, the either and neither, the nether center of miscellany culture. Duntime Mahalia gutturally told us in tongues, possessed how I, how we, how you and me got overrun. River Jordan, this side the speaking, this side being undone. It's the white page versus black finality, vinyl versus anthropology, banging on wax. Auto ventriloquism and tribalism gone Osirian. The importation of broken English, open, North, Grifton, and no trade tariff on Riffin. No laws against trafficking tradition, or trading on insiders' nihilism, or bullets to water crypticism. All this and still rhythm. Translation, his master's voice biting the air. Here in the hole of a dug up mine, objects pan for distinction, something glittering. Prester John in the mirror, analogous hands, digital countenances. I shake my rattle to the global click track, product, product, metronomic. Ethnic nationalist manna crackles out of satellites like prestidigitation. All my fellow post sufferers at sea in the lingua franca, the stutter. We are a cargo cult 
of reception, a buffer between selves. Come again, the packaging of our traumas, blood, our bastardizing of the scripts from the metropole, the black ones. These are the ready-made blues in the backwoods, backwards, a spiral lineage, a route through. Take you to write that, just out of curiosity. Um, you know, I can't remember. I mean, that was one. That was that was something I didn't labor over a lot. Like I think that one kind of spilled out. Did it? Yeah. And I mean, I think it, I think it came out of a lot of years of thinking about some of the problems in it. But the writing of it was fairly short, and then a, you know, and then an edit. But you know, some of the things that you're that you're pointing out. I mean, I think in a lot of ways, it's my it's it, it's my you know, it, it, again, from one angle, it's my poem that's trying to deal with um, the problem of traditions and the and the um, you know the broken line between ancestral traditions and what I'm left with. You know, and in a lot of ways, like I just feel like in so many ways, I have uh, um, you know I've inherited sort of this kind of you know you know um, shards of shards of culture, shards of knowledge about cool. you know my past and. All of that, and then being mixed race and being sort of outside of the, um, you know, the kind of the areas of the black diaspora that people really associate with, um, you know, the, the kind of uh, main line of the culture. So all of those things, I, f I think it's in a lot of ways we trying to deal with that. Like where, where are we now? Because so much of hip hop, I, the sort of golden age of hip hop that we were talking about, was all about these affirmations of culture, like black power, black pride, and all that. Yeah. And so me kind of taking James, the James Brown line. You know, say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud, and saying, you never said, you know, say it loud, I'm mixed race and a satellite of, of the U.S. and proud. It's kind of, you know, me saying, well, where, you know, what do you do when that pride's not quite enough, or it's not tackling all that's gone on? You know, it's not that simple to just say, it's a matter of being proud. It's kind of, it's much, much more complicated for me anyway. And yeah. uh, that was me trying to trying to cope with that. I think. Cool. Just another one other quick question. Who, is your, who are your inspirations in terms of yeah. music artists? Yeah. Um, Do you have? Well, yeah. I don't know. I mean, I'm making an assumption. Yeah. I mean, well, it, yeah, it's changed over the years. Even it's changed since I wrote this. So, um, you know, I. I'm getting old, so I, I mean, I like I like hip hop. I'm getting old. Well, you know, <laughs> seasoned individual. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> you know, I like Senator the Tabernacle. I like the hip hop from the kind of that middle golden period of the late '80s and maybe early '90s, but really the late '80s, and and um, you know, the experimentation with noise when hip hop used to experiment with noise, you know, mm -hmm. um, you know, and yeah, when there, it just seemed like there was much more play in it. And now it seems to have kind of hardened into its own tradition in a way. And so um, I like that then, and I've kind of stopped listening to it recently. And so you know, I find now I listen to the stuff that I always listen to, which is the background, which is the you know um, black soul music and Motown and stuff from the '60s and funk from the '70s, which is just kind of like my baseline of what music is. Okay. And then, um, cool. but when I sort of branch out and look for new things lately, it's been into. You know, free jazz and noise. I'm, I'm much more interested in sound these days than uh, than music in a way. I'm interested in mm. yeah, sound, and noise, and yeah. Cool. Well, well, thank you, my language, uh, Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.
It's an honor to meet you, sir. I have to go for a Cheers. smoke. All right. Yeah. You know, right. <laughs> <laughs> Can't do it inside here. Sure. I, I thought it was terrific. It's such a lovely, the, the combination of the music and the piece are really quite yeah. terrific. Yeah. So the question I have is a sort of a reflection on something that you said you're sort of describing what you're doing in sort of shards of uh, culture. But to me, I mean, historians are always thinking about this as sort of shards of history and shards of the past, right? Mm -hmm. Sort of words that reflect particular moments and events from the past. So if you could maybe um, say a few words about your engagement with history and how you mm -hmm. think about history and how your understanding of history sort of informed this particular piece. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, <coughs> you know, what I'll talk about tomorrow um, is, is uh, yeah, Hogan's Alley. And uh, Hogan's Alley is the old black community in Vancouver, which again, you know, which was smashed and broken apart by, through an urban renewal scheme like you know, literally smashed and because um, they, they wanted to put a freeway through it and basically got the first part of that plan done and then the protest stopped it. That was enough to um, scatter the black community. So there's like this literal smashing and literal fragmentation of the black community at that moment. Now, what's, it, what's the way I come along um, to that story is, you know, I, I, I don't descend from those old families of Hogan's Alley. You know, my, um, the black side of my family that I knew growing up, my father came to Vancouver in the late 50s from Texas, so I didn't have, it wasn't that lineage, we never lived down there, I didn't have a, you know, extended family that was there or anything. So it was more coming along later as an adult, trying to sort, of sort out, ident you know, my identity, and sort of engaging with identity politics and figuring that out. And my, met you know, one of my methods for dealing with that was to look to the history, which is very, you know, it's very common, it's like the black community you know, when we think about it this way, when, you know, when black folks in North America invent a holiday that actually sticks, you know, it's, it's Black History Month. It's this like, you know, prolonged, you know, um, one twelfth of the year when you just kind of examine the history. It's very dour in a certain way, but it, it, um, but it makes sense for a group of people who've had their history completely obscured and, you know, disrupted and, and um, you know, this, the idea of connecting back to things is this impulse that just never goes away, right? And I feel I've inherited that too. I sometimes think it's, um, uh, I mean, it's cultural that way. And then I sometimes think there's, there are personal things too, that for some reason, I, you know, I'm, um, uh, you know, compelled personally to kind of s ground myself and to figure out where I am. I think it's partly because I've had all these fragmentations and all these, ways that I felt um, like I don't have a secure kind of tr like traditional narrative or something that explains um, myself culturally or you know it, where I was seemed like a really odd place to be. I've always been this kind of you know racially liminal person. People can't figure out where I'm from or you know I get one of those people, there's a great um, project this uh, mixed race woman did, I can't remember her name, but a visual artist did this project where she sort of looks like she could be almost anything. And so she went around Vancouver and um, just found groups of friends from different like ethnocultural groups and said, can I take a picture with you? And <laughs> so she has these pictures of her like hanging out with these like native girls and then with these like Filipino girls. And like, you know, in each one you kind of like, you kind of see, you know, you could be one of them or you could be one of them or you could be one of them. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've had not, I'm not quite that like flexible, you know, but I have had all sorts of, you know, different reactions and people aren't sure, they're kind of like, you know, there's the, the racist who is, you know, racist against me for being black in one moment and then later in the day there's someone who's like, you're black? I would never in a million years have guessed. And it's like, well, these two things happen in the same day. So what is it, right? And um, that's how I grew up. Like, that's, that's my experience. So in a way I was trying to... You know, I've been trying to write that for a few years, um, and at the same time, trying to sort of find stable ground in a way. And I think that's what, that's what attracts me in particular to historical narrative. It's a way of like storytelling how things got the way they are. And so, yeah. So, okay. yeah. Okay. The question comes from the same direction. Um, you talked about how at the beginning how you both. African American hip hop is something you want to tether to, but also not. Mm -hmm. um, you don't want to be the you know, hip hop in the boondocks kind of thing. Um, 
So I was talking about reinventing wheel in your bottle poems, uh, Sling in the Fall, at a conference that was held in a museum that was featuring the work of Romare Bearden, the African American collage artist. Mm -hmm. And it was an Odyssey exhibit. And a kind of light bulb went off for me about the lash to the mast with the ears, really? the wax and everything. So yeah. Okay, so the Odyssey is one of your things you're using to work that out. Yeah. With travel and journey and temptation and so on. Would that be fair to say? Yeah, and the, yeah, and so the can there's little canonical, you know, allusions here and there throughout that poem. Um, as were pound and mm -hmm. so I mean I was yeah because but that, and that was another thing I was in, you know trying to figure out like what is my relationship to the historical and uh, and um, you know the myths that I'm engaging that are that are kind of black cultural myths or myths from the diaspora or Africa like using Shango and all of these things and. Um, and it was sort of looking at like, well, okay, is is this the same thing that the modernists did with, you know, the Greek gods, which drove me nuts. Like, you know, when you're reading through the canon, you're like, oh, you know, <laughs> Greek gods over and over again. It's like we're even from Greece. Like, why is this such a thing in English literature? It used to drive me nuts. Like when I was an undergrad, I'm just like, it's, does it, do we have to? Do I have to become versed in everything? And I just was resistant to it. And I was kind of like, I don't want to know what each and every Greek god did in every version of the story. And, um, but then at a certain point, was like, am I doing that again? Am I kind of, you know, inscribing my own route through these kind of voodoo, you know, because I was just attracted to, you know, Ishmael Reed's use of voodoo and, um, and a bunch of other writers, and also Kamal Brathwaite, too, in a, in a kind of more roundabout way. You know, they were all sort of, those kind of um, black power era writers were also doing that. Uh, you know, and I was kind of, well, am I just inheriting that all over again, or what do you do with that, right? And so, anyway, th th those are open questions for me. I'm not really sure, but, you know. Just to maybe follow up on those two, but mm -hmm. the, the one line, you know, because somebody said there's so much information, right? When you read it, when you can yeah. have it in front of you in paper, you can actually kind of read it twice. And kind of, but I think one of your lines is something like the Humphrey Caden will not be metaphorized. Which is yeah. the revolution will not be televised, right? Yeah. So, yeah. so what's what's the relationship, right? Because that's also a canon, right? Mm -hmm. That, that yeah. very famous slogan. And so, are you, right? Because you talked about your distance from other parts of Canada, but also like the relationship to different types of hip hop. Mm -hmm. So, do you just want to workshop a line like that? You know, like is right. it, it's just funny and it's witty and it's very well done, but. What's the relationship to it? Is it like a you know because that is a canon, right? Is, is, yeah. it, is it only ironic or is it? Yeah. Well, I think, I mean, for me, I think it's like partly it's plugging in, like taking my own identity position and plugging it in to these, you know, um, you know, those famous lines and those ways of thinking about that are coming out of the civil rights movement and the black arts movement. Right. They were kind of meant to be solutions to this right. problem of, okay, we are some, you know, we're a different culture or they're nationalists really, right, in the, in the States where you could, you could be black, you could be a black nationalist with a straight face down there in the 60s anyway, right? And, um, <clears throat> you know, so that, that project brought us you know, great literature. And that was what, you know, I early on really identified with and then quickly found the places where that just kind of slides off me. It doesn't quite work. And so, yeah, when I, you know, when those, those quotations kind of ring out and I warp them a bit, it's, it's, it's me trying to think them through and kind of say, well, the revolution will not be televised. Okay, but what does that mean here, right? And how do you, you know, what does that mean to me? And so, you know, the, the mulatto will not, will not be metaphorized. Because um, that's what happens to, you know, the mulatto figure in literature is that they become this metaphor for this, you know, for all these different things. It's this, um, it just still gets perpetuated, that kind of, tr yeah, this drives me insane is the, um, you know, the black and white, black and white, it's just unfortunate that we use those metaphors to talk about, you know, these so, you know, so-called racial groups. If we'd just gone with, you know, peach and brown or something like that, <laughs> we would eliminate all of this stupid, thi like lazy thinking that ends up giving us these horrible things like, you know, the cover of Danzy Senna's brilliant book, Caucasia, which just, in so many ways, the, the, she's an um, African-American writer, mixed race woman, um, she just in so many ways like undoes race in that novel. And then when you look at the, I think it's the Canadian, the French, uh, Canadian edition of the book in French, and on the cover, so it's about two, two mixed race sisters who in, you know, in the book are clearly, you know, kind of ambiguous, like they're, 
you know, one leans more towards looking black and one leans more towards looking white, but they're sort of ambiguous. But, it, you know, the image on the cover is this kind of like blonde child and this dark, dark skinned child. And you're just like, oh, like, that binary is just so strong that people don't. Or there's that book, there's a critical book of essays on uh, George Eliot Clark that just came out that I have an essay in and I was all excited to see it. And I saw the cover and I'm like, it's this black and white image of his profile, and I'm just like, it's so, stu it's so stupid, it's so strong that we've got this binary. You talk about black people, it's like, black and white, and it's just this, you know what I mean? And so, anyway, that for me, that was the, um, you know, that's the, the revolution I want, is to stop thinking in that binary. So it's me, so I'm plugging myself into those kind of inheritances, those revolutionary inheritances, and, try, and they don't always fit, and I'm trying to, turn them in some kind of way that makes them fit more. Um, I have two questions that might be related. I guess the, the way I put it first is, is could you say something about um, just the performance choices you make about what kind of music you're going to perform with and how much difference it makes to you? Mm -hmm. And then the second part of the question is about the relationship between tradition, which you're obviously interested in, but also the kind of avant-garde dimension of your performance, especially with this kind of musical accompaniment that seems like largely an avant-garde gest gesture, but partly about tradition. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, I was, uh, yeah, I felt really lucky to have been able to perform with Nick, because when I heard his music, so Jay sent me some audio files of, of his stuff, and I was just like, this is great. I, I gave, I can't think, the one um, request was that it's, that um, you know not to pair me with a beat oriented DJ, and um, and then so I think you know he thought of Nick and it hurt some and I was just like this is it right so um, you know when when I do the the performance piece with Jason who we sort of work um, you know this poem was written for that you know for performance so when I wrote it I was also experimenting with turntables at the same time that was happening so it was I was playing with sound and playing with the turntables and, and thinking of it and I quickly did figure out that I didn't want it to be rap you know I didn't want it to be this really metered thing that's uh, in these quatrains and you know or rhyming couplets that's you know I didn't want it to be that stable I wanted it to be much more unstable it kind of the, the, you know those moments come in and then they go away right there are there's rhyme in it um, but then it drops out, and um, and so in the performance, it's funny. Like in the early days when we performed it, um, you know, we did a few like outdoor festivals. And I sort of gradually had this list of things that I would never do anymore after like trying them out, and then like an outdoor festival was one. Right? Like, okay, cross that up. Never do outdoor festivals anymore. And um, no outdoor festivals, no nightclubs. Those are the two things that we took off, and that was because. Um, it works best in a setting like this when people are sitting there listening, like like they would at a poetry reading, because that's what it is. Mm -hmm. And um, but it's you know when you have turntables at an outdoor festival or nightclub, people see the turntables, and then especially if we had a few beats, they'd hear a couple beats, and people would like jump up and start dancing, <laughs> and then you know the beats would go away, and we'd have some weird noisy sound wash thing, and me re you know my voice or just the acapella dry and they'd be like what's going on this is not what i signed up for and the only place where that worked where it worked okay was in montreal montreal okay. and yeah this one Anything works performance in montreal and people were like the beats come on they start dancing the beats drop away and they're just like stopped and listened and the beats go back and they're like dancing and i was like okay for some reason that I think there's been years of preparation, cabaret culture, and some, there's something in that city that's advanced in that way. That, but um, uh, so you can put that back on the list. Yeah, there. I guess yeah, I'm gonna do that. But um, but you know, yeah. I mean, it, it. Yeah, it's interesting if you look at the. Yeah. So I think in the same way that that the that the poem is trying to take apart um, hip hop and sort of rebuild something. And that, you know, and that's why, <clears throat> that's why my interest is in um, right now is in hip hop from everywhere but North America, um, because I'm fascinated by the way, you know, and in a lot of ways that's it's it's actually so I go back and forth between saying it's anti hip hop or it's you know pro hip hop, but um, it's I guess it's a bit of both or something. But you know, if a if a if a culture or subculture is very very strong, you know. Um, then it becomes a world culture, right? And I think that's what's happened to hip hop is it's so powerful, so effective, and so innovative that it became a, a world cultural pr 
product, right? And um, at this point, that's what it should do, and people should let it do that. And I'm interested in the places that, that receive it and use it in some really different way, like some local way, and they kind of bend it and make it something else. And, um, and I think that counts uh, in Western Canada too, for sure, is it should be bent more than it is, mm -hmm. to bent to the breaking point. And so in a lot of ways I feel like going back down to sound and going back down to let's start down there and just go what sounds are possible, what works with this and, you know, rather than just say, well, hip hop is this kind of beat and just, you know, the funky drum would break or the amen break or something, you hear that over and over again. Rather than just starting with that, just kind of break it down to a more basic level and sort of build it up again from there. And so to me that kind of, yeah, that sort of, um, much it's much freer. I mean, what he's playing is so, it's so free and there's so many possibilities. And I'm, I love doing this kind of performance because, um, you know, when we came in, first I was really anxious about like, we got to do four hours of practicing before. And then when we sat down for a couple seconds, I was like, no, this is going to work actually. And maybe better if we just, sound check and then do it and we'll hear you know because then we ended up really improvising we're not sure what exactly is going to happen and that's fun like to me that's that's exciting and that you know that makes sense for the, for the project um i don't know if that answers the avant-garde question sure. but yeah. yeah i was just wondering because you were talking about the sonic possibilities right and usually you speak about them as a you know hip-hop mine is hip-hop right so you, you, mm -hmm. you Present them uh, against that foil of hip hop, but I'm just wondering there are clearly like other sonic possibilities and tonal structures that you're also thinking about that don't necessarily come from the hip hop tradition, right? Because yeah. I think this music comes from all kinds of interesting backgrounds. Yeah. So you know, I was wondering what other avenues you, you you're thinking or you're using to think about those things. Well, in a way, I mean that's music like moving possible. back to hip the origins of hip hop, like the early days of it were far. Uh, less conventional than it's become now. Like it's, it's the conventions hardened at a certain point. But if you look at, you know, and the, you know, the, the older D, it's interesting. You get this weird thing where you, you see an interview with Grandmaster Flash or some of these like originators of it, and to me they sound more radical than um, young DJs because they will say things like, or Africa Bambada will say. You know, what we were listening to was we were trying to find the weirdest European like you know, German, Krautrock, obscure, you know, they were just, or, you know, or jazz records, or they were just, they were looking for sounds, and sounds to sample, and things like that. And now it's all, it's like so much is looking for hooks, right? Like what hook will, you know, it's now a pop music sensibility, for the most part. I mean, I mean, this is why I still love DJ culture, like I think, and we still, still talking about hip hop, like it's one thing, but it's all of these different elements, and the DJ is the one element that I've, consistently loved because in a lot of ways like the D, you know the DJ culture is still quite pure and and geeky because it can't make money you know like the DJ sets if you, you bought you know a few DJs like pure DJs they don't have a MC right but they're just like putting together records out of their their own sets some of those sell records but not I think it's, it's a different kind of selling records like it's a kid koala or something like that who buys records, but they're weird, and they're experimental and strange. And if you go see one of those live sets, you have no idea what you're going to see. You know, when you see Kid Koala perform, it's just, you just have no idea what's going to happen. He's going to have turntables and do things to them that you never thought possible. So it's just much more, it's just much weirder, and it's not saleable. I think that's why. It's like poetry, right? It's the same reason why poetry is a good place to go for rethinking basic things. I think that's true with um, DJ culture, not so much with rap, where it's kind of become, you can do things that will make you money, and so people try to do those things over and over. I have a question for Nick, because just kind of looking through all the different performers that you've performed with and thinking about Can or you know so, some of the other things you've been involved with, I'm just curious what your thoughts are, given the same kind of process, you know, I opened the door for you like an hour and a half ago. Yeah. You guys had met. Just, just interested for how you were processing everything. Well, it's interesting. Uh, I mean, typically, if I'm doing an improvisational thing, it's um, it's a little different uh, because it's usually interacting with another musician or by myself. So, um, 
Yeah, it's a, it's a very different thing listening to words and sort of trying to sort of follow that. Uh, so part of what I was uh, reflecting, I guess, was 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 just the actual sort of musicality of the the, of the words, which I sense was a sort of a pretty important aspect of the of your work as well. Like a, it's another sort of facet of it that it's harder to discuss in this sort of format. But it, I, I I was sort of following that and also and, and also trying to sort of accent certain things that he was. He was saying, and then you can follow follow that. So it's a different, it's a totally different thing that I'm accustomed to usually. Because, you know, but it was it was great. I mean, with in, in theater engagements, for instance, I'm it's usually compo like composed out, and it's just it's a totally different sort of thing, and um, it may be even pre-recorded with uh, like a certain level of it pre-recorded and playing over top or other musicians. So it's it's a different. So it's, it was a different process, but I, I really enjoyed it. I thought it was a really intriguing one. Yeah. I think it was kind of why I didn't want to do the whole poem when we were just yeah. sound checking because I thought, well, if you don't know what's coming, it is more like improv. You know, yeah, it is more like you're improvising because it's you know me. I've been reading this poem for years and years <laughs> to you, first time hearing it, and yeah. you're gonna have some kind of reaction to it. So yeah. Mm. <coughs> I had the same question. If you were um, yeah, it was just. Uh, well, as you can tell, I'm very happy you're here because I have all these questions for you. Um, you were speaking a little bit about the relationship of what it means to be in Vancouver and being engaged in black culture and things like there, and, and you know how that relates. Well, we talked a bit about the U.S. and influences from there, but also the rest of Canada. So I know you you work with people out there, or at the time with Karina Vernon, and, mm -hmm. and I guess with. Uh, David Charyandi and people yeah. like that, and you have the, the publishing house out there. Yeah. And and as you did, you know, I think you also had some connections or interviews that you did together. I think with Karina and I see and you and Yeah, we did it. Yeah. yeah. It's kind of and so you know, I'm just curious. Like, uh, I know you have written a whole book on that, right? The uh, the Africana, but but how do you feel about that relationship? You know, that cultural context that is going on there, and that obviously has its own logic. And its own intensities, and then whatever you know goes on in other kind of black cultures in, in the rest of Canada. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I like my, like my part of that project has mostly been trying to bring the West into it in a lot of ways, and um, I would say, I mean, there's no antagonism. Like, I, I would say, you know, um, you know. Um, you know, critics like George Eliot Clark have you know, consistently written about West, you know, Western um, Black Canadian writers, so it's been there. But there's still, there's still, you know, it felt like anyway ten years ago that um, there was a lot to do still out there and to kind of uncover things. And so I, I edited a, um, an anthology of Black uh, BC writers that um, you know was really exploratory, like it was primary research. And when I went into it. You know, I had I didn't know if it would fly at all, and um, and was just finding writers that I didn't you know know about through the process, and so um, that was in 2001. So it's really in a lot of ways things are a bit later. The history is more shallow out there, right? So um, it's a much longer uh, Black history in, in Central Canada and the East as well. So um, that makes sense, but. Um, yeah, I mean, now, 10 years after that, it feels like there's some foundation for those things. But, I mean, in terms of the country, yeah, I don't know. It's such a big country, and it's so regional. Um, it just feels fluid. Like, it really depends on who's doing what. And one person could come along and publish something that just feels like everything kind of shifts, like Essie, right? Things just sort of shift, and you're like, oh, she's from BC, and she's right about Germany. You know, and it's so yeah I don't know it's uh it seems less of a worry to me than it did back then like back even just 10 years ago it felt much more like we have to we have to figure out the West in a way and um you know it's the prairies that's next it's the Karina's project I mean, the black prairies that's what we need to bring in it's the, the people don't know about I don't know about she's going to tell us all about it so Karina Vernon is doing is she still doing this or yeah she's doing a project on Black Prairie writers. That'll be a book, I think, coming out yeah. in a year or two, maybe. Yeah, yeah. And that's going to change the map all over again, right? We're going to learn a whole bunch of new things and think differently about, you know, Black Canadian culture. But uh, yeah, yeah. It's 
Yeah, it's such a funny thing. I mean, I think like with, I mean, even with Blues Print, I remember feeling like, in my introduction, I was careful to say, you know, this is provisional, and this kind of naming of, of black BC literature is going to be very provisional, because these writers are going to, um, it's all going to look different down the road, and maybe that's not even the right designation, BC. Maybe it's Western Canada, or it's Pacific Northwest, or something like that, or that will change. I think the same way about Canada, really, is like, yeah. does it make sense? Like, sometimes it makes sense to look at North American blackness, sometimes global blackness or the diaspora, and sometimes Canada specifically. It all really depends, you know. The big surprise for me within the last five years was spending a bit of time in the States and among African Americans. And um, uh, I did a um, kind of a long workshop at uh, Texas A&M um, with like black writers from all over the States. And <clears throat> for some reason, it was the first moment where it kind of sunk in that you know African Americans are regional. They're as regional as we are here. Uh, maybe more, you know, because I was with people, you know, folks from maybe it was just the set, like just having a bunch of people from all different places rather than going one at a time to those places, but having someone from Maine and someone from uh, you know Oregon and someone from Texas and someone from D.C. and all these places, and you realize like, wow, they are all coming to each other with like regional variants and things like that. And for some reason we have this sense up here, or I did anyway, of, you know, my dad's African American, but I still have this sense of it's this monolith, like there's black American culture, and it's this one thing. And I sort of was reminded, you know, any large country has its regions, and, you know. So it's not our unique problem in a way. Uh, I think just that, I don't know, I mean, something about the US tends to push things together, maybe because they have this um, place in the world stage or something like that. They can appear to be a monolith or something like that. And whereas we are less likely to assert it or something, I don't know, but it's still there. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you.